My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to do a video on atrial fibrillation and in particular I wanted to explain why some people feel their atrial fibrillation really badly and others don't even know that they have atrial fibrillation. Um, before I start I just wanted to let everyone know that I will be in New York on the 4th and 5th of August and I will be hosting a heart health seminar for patients. Uh, during this seminar, you can come and ask me anything you like, and I will be offering free consultations uh, to all those who've reserved a spot. If you'd like to register, please consider visiting www.hearthealthweekend.com. Uh, places are limited, and our closing date is on the 30th of July, so if you can uh, register, then please do so now. Okay, great. Now that's all over. Let's talk about atrial fibrillation. There are two types of patients I often come across with atrial fibrillation. There are patients who will say they feel their atrial fibrillation and they feel really unwell when they have their atrial fibrillation. So they will feel that they're getting palpitations, they'll feel breathless, they'll feel dizzy. They just feel awful. All right. And then there's another group of patients who don't even know they have atrial fibrillation. They come, they're having a flu jab and someone will notice an irregular pulse and that is the first time they know that they have atrial fibrillation. And so to those people who feel their atrial fibrillation, this has always been a question that they've asked me, that they say, well, I feel so incredibly awful with this. How is it possible that people can get this and not even know about it? How is that even possible? So I thought I'd do a video on this to try and explain why this happens. Okay, in general, I find that the people who tend to really struggle with their atrial fibrillation are tend to be young. They tend to be generally very fit and healthy. They don't tend to be ill in any way. They don't tend to have diabetes, high blood pressure. Nothing like that. They're generally fit people and then for some reason they develop atrial fibrillation and this atrial fibrillation comes and goes and every time they get an episode it comes out of the blue and they just feel absolutely horrendous. And when they um, and then they come into hospital and they, they, they're given some medications or have a shock treatment and that gets them out of their atrial fibrillation. And then the other group tend to be much older, they tend to be much sicker, they tend to have diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, all sorts of things. And actually these people don't even know that they have atrial fibrillation and so they're incidentally found to have atrial fibrillation. What is really interesting is that if you take these young healthy people who cannot tolerate their atrial fibrillation, who feel awful, actually uh, as they're young and as they're otherwise healthy, they don't actually seem to have a higher incidence of strokes. They feel awful with their atrial fibrillation, but it doesn't seem to translate into a higher incidence of strokes. Whereas those people who actually don't even know they have atrial fibrillation, they tend to be older, they tend to be sicker in terms of other comorbidities such as diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, etc. And they have a much higher incidence of stroke. So what is really interesting is that the people who seem to really struggle with symptoms in whom the atrial fibrillation really affects their quality of life tend to be younger and generally healthier and don't tend to have strokes, whereas the people who uh, do tend to have strokes don't even actually notice their atrial fibrillation. Why is that? Well, what is the why the discrepancy amongst these two groups of patients and the answer is this the first thing to understand is that we often think that when you are in a normal heart rhythm your heart your atria are working fine okay so in a normal heart rhythm um, or uh, you know when we're in, when our atria are working they contribute to 15% of the filling of the heart. So the heart is um, filling up with blood and then the atria will put another 15% of blood in. That causes the heart to stretch and then the heart contracts with more strength. It's a little bit like a rubber band. If you stretch it by an extra 15%, it'll twang, it'll twang together with more force. And the heart is a bit like that. So if you have that extra 15% that the atria contribute, the heart will stretch more and make for it and the it will uh, uh, beat with greater efficiency and it'll pump more blood out. Um, so that 15% can be important um, and uh, I'll try and explain this. So we often assume that if you're in sinus rhythm, your atria are working fine. And if you're in atrial fibrillation, your atria are not working at all. 
And this is a wrong assumption. Whilst it is true to say that when you're in atrial fibrillation, the atria are not functioning completely, uh, are, are not contracting at all, it is a wrong assumption to make that just because you're in sinus rhythm, you can assume that the atria are working fine. In fact, what can happen is that the atria can gradually weaken and progressively weaken and weaken, but they don't actually start fibrillating. So on the ECG, they still you know, you are still in sinus rhythm, in a normal rhythm, but the atria may be weakening and weakening and weakening, and eventually they go into atrial fibrillation. However, if they're weakening, they may still not push in any effective amount of blood. So they may not still be able to push in 15% of the blood that you normally expect them to push in. So in people who are older, who have diabetes, who have high blood pressure, etc., what tends to probably happen is they tend to develop this thing called an atrial myopathy, which means that the atria are progressively getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And because the atria are getting weaker and weaker, they're pushing less and less blood. So they're inside the ventricle. And therefore, eventually, when the heart goes into atrial fibrillation, the patient doesn't really notice any difference because the atria were not really doing very much for a long time before the patient went into atrial fibrillation. And that's why these people who are older, who have diabetes, who have high blood pressure, who have sleep apnea, who are obese, they don't even know that they've gone into atrial fibrillation because they are not missing out on that 15% because that 15% went a long time ago, even before the development of atrial fibrillation. In a young person, however, everything is fine. The heart is working fine. The atria are nice and healthy and they're pushing in that 15%. And for some reason, when they go into atrial fibrillation, suddenly they lose that 15%. And that is why they hate it so much. Because their heart was working perfectly fine, their atria were contributing the filling of the heart, of the ventricle, and suddenly the loss of that 15% contributes in a big way to why they feel so symptomatic. An analogy, an easy analogy with this is ventricular fibrillation, you know. So we see people who develop ventricular fibrillation, which means, which is the same as death. Uh, the ventricle is not contracting at all but it is a wrong assumption to make that if you're in sinus rhythm the ventricle is contracting fine in fact we know a lot of people have progressive ventricular dysfunction and people can actually form clots in their ventricles long before they develop ventricular fibrillation because the ventricle is getting progressively weaker and weaker and ventricular fibrillation is an electrical endpoint of the ventricle and in the same way um, atrial fibrillation is an endpoint it's an electrical endpoint but we cannot assume that the heart is mechanically fine before that electrical endpoint is reached and so in sicker people in people who are older maybe the atrial fibrillation is just the endpoint but they've developed a progressively weaker weakening um, atrium over a period of time and therefore when they go into atrial fibrillation they don't notice any change and they feel completely okay but remember that because they're sicker and their atria have been progressively getting weaker and weaker they may have started developing clot formation in the atria even before they go into atrial fibrillation and that's why they may have a much higher stroke risk whereas with the younger person who just gets atrial fibrillation as and when who's otherwise healthy the atria are working really really well and suddenly you cut out and you lose that 15 percent and because of that they probably don't get the strokes because their atria were working completely well before they went into atrial fibrillation so there was no scope for clot formation, etc. So this is probably the reason why some people uh, notice their atrial fibrillation and feel really unwell with it and why other people um, don't. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter in terms of stroke risk. What you need to use to calculate your stroke risk is not how bad you feel with the atrial fibrillation, but in fact your CHADS2 VASCs or your comorbidities, your age, if you're above the age of 65, if you have diabetes, if you have high blood pressure, if you've had previous strokes or heart failure or vascular disease. Those are the things uh, that will help you decide your stroke risk. But I hope this helps you understand why some people feel atrial fibrillation and others don't. Um, if you would like to talk to me, please consider visiting my website, www.yourcardiology.co.uk. And uh, if you'd like to um, correspond with me, then you can also visit my Facebook page, uh, which is Your Cardiology One. Again, please consider visiting um, the Heart Health Weekend website, www 
www.hearthealthweekend.com. Thank you so much. All the best. Uh, take care.